uh, Pastor Skip Hansen, who will be our speaker today. And uh, uh, just a little controversy first, you know, uh, Ron, um, uh, sorry, last week, I mean, he did the, the Vikings Packers thing, having had connections to both of them. Now, uh, Skip is uh, from northern Minnesota, but he served in Iowa before. So, you know, uh, we didn't have such a good outcome yesterday, but were you happy or sad for that? Tell me. I wasn't paying attention to that yesterday. Okay, good, good. Good answer. <laughs> I, Skip and Linda have been married 53 years, and uh, they have um, uh, two daughters uh, who are married and four grandchildren. Uh, Linda was a school teacher and is a, a ministry partner with Skip over the years. Uh, he graduated from Dem Denver Seminary in 1969, and then instead of going into pastoral ministry, he was on the staff there as superintendent of construction buildings and grounds also serving uh, as a drill sergeant and mortar section leader in the uh, Army Reserve. So um, uh, interesting background. And then planted three churches in Colorado, Wyoming, Iowa. And then as I mentioned, in 2000, uh, he, the Converged Churches in Iowa called him to be the di district executive minister where he uh, served there while Linda was teaching high school. Uh, and since retirement, uh, he's been involved in interim ministry at five uh, different churches, and um, so we welcome you, Skip Hansen, to join us this morning. They, thank you. Thank you, Paul. And uh, they were all Minnesota churches, too. Just want you to know that. And I want you to know that uh, Roger and Sharon came from the, one of the churches that we worked at. Hi, Roger. And and Sharon said, standing right there just before the service, she said, she said, this is as close as we could find to Pillager. So immediately, I don't know if you like me, but immediately, I like you. <laughs> so there you go. This is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice. We choose to do that. We rejoice and we're glad in it. And, and I want to thank I want to thank Bethany and the worship team. What a, what a wonderful entry into the Father's house and, and to worship, to worship together. One of the things that's, well, I, there's a lot of things about me that are odd, but you may have noticed that while we were singing, I'm seated. Part of why that is is because I'm old and I don't want to be too tired when I get up here. And, and part of it, is because the singing from behind me and the leading from in front of me washes over me by the Spirit of God and prepares me to stand here and pray, God, may these words and these meditations be acceptable to you, and may this be your message to your people, not a sermon that I'm preaching. So here we are. Uh, Linda is the lovely nine and a half NB blonde woman, right? Right beside Sharon? Because I knew that they would laugh. Well, the guys might not know, and the women would go, what a dog he is. See, so it, they're all on your side now. <laughs> okay. The, the uh, message this morning that, oh, and one other thing I want to say is, I'm the guy here this morning with the book. Does anybody else have the book? There's not, there's a few, a handful. Most of you have it on your phones, I understand. Or you know that it's going to be on the screen, and so it will be on the screen this morning. But I haven't given up the book, all right? There we, there we are. And this morning, the title of the message that I've given it is Finding Our Manna, a message of thanksgiving. And I confess, I always struggle over the, the title of a message. Uh, I usually don't put a title on it until I'm all done, but then I'm so conflicted about all the different thoughts. I just share with you that this was the one I settled on. Maybe you would prefer more the title, Hey, where's my manna? Because of circumstances in your life. Or, or maybe you'll think about, well, manna moments. That's got a nice ring to it with a subtitle, is that all there is? The manna moments in our lives? Or maybe you'd pick something else together. Maybe after the message time this morning, you might like to say, 
you missed the really good one, and I'll write that down if I ever present this message to another church. Look at the slide, the next slide. Whoa. This slide is, a, is, a, is an encapsulation of, of losses, frustrations. These are the realities of our life over the last couple of years. These are real things. I mean, right at the heart of it is COVID-19. Sorry, we're closed. Uh, yeah, so businesses close, they lose clientele that maybe never come back. Churches went online and people maybe don't come back. And, and, on, and so there's, there's been chaos and riots. That's a picture from downtown you know where. And death and isolation. People that have lost precious ones, or maybe somebody in this room lost precious ones who you couldn't even be with them. I've been with many people who have gone to be with the Lord and held their hands and loved on them in their final moments. And, and people have been robbed of that. And, and uh, up there in the black, inflation going up and our retirement funds, the things that we are de dependent upon for our future, so we think, going down. These are the realities that we're getting up in the morning and facing and the divisions between the reds and the blues and the who knows who's. And, and we're, we're, we're just at, at loggers heads with one another over these things. And, and supply chains closed down. And, and, and did you hear this last week? What happened? The greatest, the greatest Ponzi scheme that's ever been developed in the whole world, in my estimation, and what do I know? The Bitcoin movement. You know where you buy bits and pieces of nothing until you own a lot of it and then it goes up in value because somebody wants more of the nothing that you have until somebody says, okay, I've got all the nothing I want. I'm cashing out for dollars and I'm done. And it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> and people that invested their, their savings and their, their resources disappeared. Uh, dollar bills become like toilet paper. Mark Biorlo, a short while back, the president of our, of our Minnesota-Iowa conference, Converge North Central, that's a picture of his house. It burned down, gone. I, I read about one lady who, her house burned down too, but it wasn't her house that mattered. She lost a lifetime of quilting. She lost her sewing machine, her stash, you know who that is, what that is. She lost everything she had created, and worse, she lost everything that her mother had left her in that same... Her heart was broken, crushed. My best friend, who was, who was the uh, best man at our wedding, and he has been my protector because I was a little snotty kid when I was well, still a snotty old man sometimes, but... He was my protector when others wanted to beat up on me, all the way from kindergarten, and he was our best man. And last year, they just finished, he and his wife just finished supper, and they sat down in the living room, started to talk. She leaned her head back, and she went to heaven. Not a warning in the sky, nothing, just gone. All of these things that we're facing, uh, I was building a house that was probably more house, well, it's a little small cottage-type house, but it was probably more of a project than an old man should do, and I injured my shoulder, and I didn't go to the doctor right away, and then I finally went to, the went to the doctor, and he said, well, we'll take some MRIs, so they took the MRIs, and while he's gone, he goes to France, I go to the Boundary Waters, I get in the Boundary Waters, I'm standing the first moments when we first arrived at the campsite, and I'm standing out on a rock, and I'm going to catch the first fish, and I lost my balance, completely lost my balance, and fell backwards to into what I didn't know and landed on a rock right across my shoulder blades, straight across my shoulder blades, just like that. And I ripped this half apart and ripped this one completely into shreds. So now this shoulder will never fire a gun again, ever. It'll never hit a tennis ball or a, or a golf ball. It will never do anything. I tried to shoot a, a hoop just standing there. 
the ball went about three feet off the end. And my grandson laughed at me. And I couldn't see the humor in it. <laughs> losses. It's been a couple of years of horrible losses and struggles and suffering. So you, so as I've been going through this list and establishing this, this what, what, what's come to your mind when you think about the losses? And what are your responses to those losses? You know, there's a de-evil one, devil, de-evil one who, who impresses his choices of how we should respond upon us. He, he says, hey, you can dismiss it. Just dismiss it. You, you, you're tough. You can tough it out. Or you can be disgusted. Disgusted with those people. It was their fault, not my fault, not your fault. Disappointment. You can be kind of broken because you have been treated unfairly and you know it. And it's okay to be disappointed. And you can be discouraged. My goodness. But you'll have to work harder, he says to us, even if you can't. Or you may fall into despair. You know there's no way out. I know this is never, ever going to change in this body. You have things that are far more significant than that. So you might as well give up. That's Satan's idea. You may have gone through denial, and the stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and ultimately acceptance. Or you may have gone the quasi-Christian route, coping, coping. You know, Emily Dickinson said... We turn not older, but newer every day. I'm telling you, that may be a coping skill, but it ain't true. <laughs> I've looked at this body. I've tried to think with this mind, and there's nothing newer about it. <laughs> the, well, humans look for the upside, and they try to find ways to cope. Adjust and accept. This morning, the message from God this morning for God's people is that we have much, much more than just coping. If we go to Matthew chapter 6, Jesus was speaking, and I think the message of how our response, the response that we can choose to take, begins right here in this passage begins with this incredible lesson on prayer. It says, "Pray." That Jesus, these are the words of Jesus. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Can, can I say that there's too much to unpack here? We're just going to focus in on one of the phrases. We're going to focus in on the idea that Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. Wait a minute. Don't we earn our daily bread? Isn't that why we go to work? Jesus says there's something daily, something that's regular in the experience of those who follow him, something that's part of their normal routine is to exercise the knowledge of who gives us our daily bread, even if we have to work. So, let's look at Genesis chapter 3, where it all began. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Oh, I love to talk about what happened between Eve and the de-evil snake Satan one another day. Like us, knowing good and evil. And now... He might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground, gave him a job. 
hard work to cultivate, to cultivate the ground from which he was taken, so he drove the man out. Consequence of that sin was God cutting them off. Loss and struggle. It would be, it would be the sweat of work and the pain of childbirth and then physical death and all the stuff leading up to that. And that was where sin entered into the world. And, and he enticed human beings in that moment to believe that there was another way of thinking about life that made more sense in a certain kind of a way than believing in that which God had revealed as truth. And somehow or another, they believed that enticement. It seemed so right, and they lost fellowship with God. They lost the ease of life and the abundance of God. They, they were separated from the tree of life, physical death and the pain and all of that. And so Jesus, in that Matthew text, is bringing them back to think, making it clear that we are choosing to invite God to exercise his will in this world, to build his kingdom and to provide for us our daily need. It had been his will to cut him off. But in Jesus, he was saying, but there's a way back. For people to regularly, every day, acknowledge that dependent relationship on him. But, Exodus chapter 16, a little story of God's people. The sons of Israel set out into the wilderness. On the 15th day of the second month, the whole congregation grumbled against Moses and Aaron would that we had died by the Lord's hands in the land of Egypt. There, we sat by pots of meat, and we ate bread until our stomachs were full. And you brought us out here to kill this whole assembly with hunger. That's quite an accusation, looking back and looking at now. And then the Lord told Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven, and the people shall go out and gather, what? Help me here, don't, don't nod off yet. <laughs> a day's portion, a day. Give us this day our daily bread. Go out and gather, do the work to gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. Will, will my people hear what I'm saying to them, or will they do what they have done, choose that other way to live? In this text, God provided, and how did the people respond? They pouted. God provided, people pouted. And on top of that, they had to get up and go out and do the work of finding the manna, gathering up the manna, pick it up, oh, bad back, and bring it back and prepare it and eat it, and then put God's provision inside themselves. They had a lot to do with this. And the worst part about it was, as they looked at it, they looked at what they had to do here and now in direct comparison to what they used to have back when they were slaves. Somehow or another, when God, God has a, a provision and a blessing for us and, a, and some manna, we think it was better then when we, when we figured out how to do it, but no. 
They were slaves, and, and, but what they remember, because they're getting hungry, they remember the pots of meat, and, and they remember the bread that filled them, and, and, and the aroma of the baking bread. Whoa, that's one of the good things in this life. And they remembered all of that. They forgot about the slavery, and they grumbled, and they complained. And we're faced with our own losses. When I lost my shoulder, do you think I grumbled? Thank you. <laughs> 100%. Oh, I had to work so physically hard, so physically hard just to get this thing to work again. They tore it apart, rebuilt it, turned it upside down and said, here, you back muscles back here, you do what this muscle up here used to do to the extent you can, but you can't. I can hold a drill in my hand or an impact driver. I can do that right to there, right to there. It's good. I can actually get it up here. Well, I can get it up there if I go like this. <laughs> Somebody knows. Yeah. And then when I get it up there, I can't do anything with it. Last week I was trying to. I had a three and a half inch long screw and I had the impact driver and a two by six up against the edge of a wall. I was going to build some substructure. I started that screw up there in that hard piece of old fur lumber and I was holding that fur lumber in place and this tiny bandage now is the result of what was a big bandage originally and it was a failed attempt on my part to try to drive with an impact driver the bit of that tool through my fingered thumbnail. It didn't work entirely that well. It'll heal. No participation in all the things I love. Failed participation in other things that I try to love. What about you? Have you ever grumbled? Or have you gone out looking for the manna, God's provision? Are you thankful to be fed daily by the provisions of God? Or are you looking back and forgetting how rough it was, even when you thought you were doing well? But even when we're looking for man in our life today and not grumbling, we can still easily come to the place where, okay, God, but it's not enough really in your heart? Okay, you're thankful that you're not crippled. Oh, I'm thankful that when I fell, I fell on this rock that was, had a ledge on it like the edge of a step there, and I landed on my shoulder blades, between my shoulder blades, two or three inches farther up, would have been right there. Quad or dead? I'm thankful I'm here. Really, I'm thankful. But is that all there is? <laughs> You get that feeling? But still, Lord, i got to deal with all of this. And so in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is pointing us back. He's teaching us that God will give you enough to get by, so accept it and look on the bright side and get on with life. Really? Is that all? <laughs> Are you sure? That's the whole thing? We need to look elsewhere for the rest of this answer. On the next slide, Jesus again is speaking. See, this is his message. This is, this is his message. Jesus said, truly I say to you, it is not Moses who gave you the bread out of heaven. Ha, ha, ha. We just looked at that. But my Father gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven. Boy, now he's starting to move into metaphors. And gives life to the world. So there was that bread, but then he's speaking about another bread. And then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread. Gives life to the world. And he replied, ah, you got it. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. Yet even though you have seen me, you do not believe. 
even though I provided for you the manna, you had to pick it up. You weren't happy about it. You're just like the rest. I've shown you myself. You do not believe. All the Father... Now, here's a promise. All the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out, for I have come from heaven not to do my own will. Oh, we're back to the will of God in all of this. But his will who sent me. You see, Jesus is choosing the will of the Father instead of the other way of looking at life. This is the will of the Father, that I lose nothing. Now, you're going to hold that thought. We're going to need that thought here in just a few minutes. That I will lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. Jesus is now speaking not about his ministry right here and now with them, but he's speaking about something that's going to happen in the future. For the Father's will is that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. I myself will raise him up on the last day. Wow. Jesus provides more than just, is, is that all bread and our provisions and our desires and our wants here and now? Let's look further at some of his words. In Revelation, he says, and then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Academics here, you can all talk about that. And the beginning and the end. And I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life no charge. We cannot earn what Jesus gives to us. We can't be worthy of it. No charge. Revelation 22. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Remember the tree of life was gated off from Adam and Eve and all of their descendants. There was no more access. Look at these images that Jesus has said about himself. He describes himself as the bread of life in John, the water of life, the tree of life. Jesus is the access point the pathway, the avenue. He's the guide. He's the Savior taking us back to the life that we lost in the garden. He's the way out, the way of escape, the once for all overcoming of our life's struggles and pain and suffering and death and the separation eternally from God. That is God's word. Regardless of what we see or want to believe as the other way, another way to think about life. Okay, so probably almost everybody in this room, maybe everybody in this room knows all of this, but this Thanksgiving, I want to point out to you Another image that Jesus gives to us. So look at the next slide. I, I don't know if you can tell at this. See all that ripply effect in the background? Honestly, that's not just a digitized image of some kind of, you know, close up of somebody's material. It, it is a picture of a massive crowd where the people are packed together by the thousands, by the tens of thousands. That's just like an aerial shot of all of them. So think about a crowd that big. That's not a Super Bowl. That makes a Super Bowl look like, you know, the peanut bowl. That's, that's, that's a big 
big group of people. And I, I put it there because it fits with Revelation 19. Then I heard the sound, a sound, I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, like peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Catch it now. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. God's will, God's plan for his people, the church, the bride of Christ, is a big, big, once for all time kind of deal. This is a God-sized thing, just like, you know, I used to talk about the Hubble spacecraft, you know, what, the, what we can see, my goodness, but the new, but the new, the new telescopes, oh my goodness, what they're discovering out there, how big this is, that God has made, and God is bigger than all of that. God is not only just like a little bit bigger than all of that, He's so much bigger than everything that we can discover by all of our scientific methods, whether we're looking up at the biggest things or looking down into the most tiny things. God is there, and God is the one who conceived it, designed it. You know, people want to talk about, well, God can't break the laws of physics. Of course he can. He made the laws of physics. We just think we've discovered them. He can do whatever he wants. He made it. And he made this thing, he, he conceived it, he designed it, he created it. And he's present in it everywhere. Whole nother set of messages. That's how big this God is. And this event is a once for all event for human beings on the face of this earth. It's a great multitude. It's roaring waters. It's not still waters. It's not an intimate family gathering. It's not a bunch of friends getting together. It's loud thunder. Bethany thinks she's loud. She's not loud. She's passionate. She's a little tiny package like Dolly with a lot of voice. <laughs> okay? Loud thunder. God celebrates loud, apparently, right there. And shouting. Shouting, not passive-aggressive, quiet conversation, gossiping at the coffee table. You know, one thing that country churches value is understanding how important the coffee shop talk is. And one of the things that sometimes we forget about that is it's the coffee shop talk that will kill a church. It's, it's, it's what people in town are saying about a church when they're not there that matters. So this is no Super Bowl. This is the marriage supper. God's will is about an eternal destination, the bride of Christ, the marriage supper. And no matter what losses we may face here and now, what pathways we have to walk, gathering this entire body of believers with thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions and hundreds of millions, and I don't know how many more, in one place to celebrate body of believers from all ages, from all places, gathered from the past, the present, and the future. We used to sing a song, I don't know if it's even considered politically reasonable today, but I think it's a good one. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. He, all of us, we got nothing on anybody else. Jesus loves and he's gathering from all of those races countless people. And look at this. The church is there. Let's look at the next slide. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. There's a couple of old school pictures when, you know, when Emily Dickinson said we're getting newer every day. I can prove that's not true. Because <laughs> that was what a new body, newer body looked like. And and that beautiful bride. She's still beautiful today. My. But I was focused on her. I wasn't looking around at everybody else. Everything was ready. Everything was perfect to becoming one. 
fine linens we were dressed. Look at, we got, I got a, text, a tux on. I wonder if casual clothes will become a thing of the past when we go to heaven. Like, I wonder if we'll dress for the occasion. Because at, at the wedding, we're going to be dressed. You know, whoa, tuxes and gowns of righteousness. The gathered church, finest linens. I wonder what those acts of righteousness might be. That would seem to be an important question, wouldn't it? That we should know that? I, I wonder if maybe the answer is connected to what we're going to look at next in the next slide. Who gets to come? Who gets to come to that wedding celebration? Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited. Those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Remember, we're on this side of the equation. This is what God is saying about what's going to happen regardless of what we think, say, or experience over here and about other ways of looking at life. An essential part of any wedding day is who's in charge of sending out the invitations? So on our most exciting, precious, holy, sacred, magnificent day, had a really interesting experience, and it wasn't fun to think about. Growing up, my family had lived in two countries, four states, and 11 houses before my wedding day. No, my dad was not a criminal, he was not in the military, and he wasn't on the run from the law. But he was climbing the corporate ladder of success. I attended two junior high schools and four high schools in six years. Boy. That was stressful. When Linda and I were preparing for our wedding, I, I didn't know where all the family members were and who we should invite and all of that. And so I said to my mom, Mom, would you send out the wedding invitations for us? Would you send us the list? Would you send us the list? Linda will send out the invitations if you'll send us the list. And of course, Linda doesn't know. You know, she's just going to get the list from my mom. I mean, if anybody knows who you should know and who should be there, should it be your mom? You can trust your mom. <laughs> so Linda got the list. She sent out the invitations. Everybody's there. And per the picture you saw moments ago, I wasn't looking around the crowd to see who was there. I was making sure Linda was coming down the aisle with her dad. It was a great wedding. Everyone was there, or so I thought. Right after the wedding, the following day, we uh, honeymooned all the way across Nebraska into Colorado to, think about that sentence, all the way across Nebraska, honeymooning, to get to Colorado to go to seminary. It took us four days to get there. I, I don't know what the drive time is today. We weren't in a hurry. <laughs> a couple months later, my cousin who was at the wedding, my favorite cousin, I had spent a couple of summers living with him in Illinois on the farm, he was killed in a farm accident suddenly. And so I had to go back to Illinois for the funeral. And at the funeral, my Uncle Earl, now he wasn't a blood relative, but my Uncle Earl, who was my dad's best friend all through life, Uncle Earl came up to me and he quietly said, he said, Skip, I just have to tell you, Lorraine and I were really hurt that you didn't invite us to the, to the wedding. Now, when those words came out of his mouth, I didn't know how to process them. Well, of, of course he must have been. He wasn't there. What? I, I didn't know what to say. But then as I thought about it, not in that moment, but as I thought about it, I stumbled through trying to say something and apologizing and all that. I began to think back. You know, my mom knew Earl and Lorraine, and she kind of never liked them. She sort of looked down on them. They weren't quite as good as us. And Earl hadn't achieved the same worldly success that her husband, my dad, had achieved. And then it dawned on me. She likely chose not to invite them that wedding because they weren't worthy. No, 
Now let's bring that back into our spiritual life and the relationships around us. Whenever we don't love somebody, it's not easy. Even for a godly, committed, church-going mom or dad to give somebody else that they look down on an invitation to the wedding. Very difficult. So being in charge of the wedding invitations is crucially important, not only for those who get an invitation, but especially for those who don't. So let's read the slide. He gives us a plus number invitation. Jesus says, I come to give you abundant life. Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. You go and make disciples, and you do to others the same that you are thankful has been done for you. You and I have been put in charge of passing out the invitations, and he's given us our invitation, but when we read the front print, it says plus you plus, and there's an open blank. You plus. Who do you want to bring with to this marriage supper of a lamb? Let's make sure that we're not looking down on anyone as unworthy to come to the marriage supper of the lamb. This Thanksgiving, next slide. No matter how topsy-turvy your life gets, no matter what's happened in the last couple of years, no matter how difficult it has been or is right now or will be, no matter what losses you've faced or experienced yet, when you see the chaos and we are tempted to ask God, is that all this mess? Is this all there is? This Thanksgiving, take some moments and remember the manna, God's real, eternal truth. This Thanksgiving, if you're a follower of Jesus, no matter what you have lost, you can choose to practice every day seeing the manna moments around you. What's a manna moment? Well, maybe it's acknowledging the very fact that I'm still standing and breathing is a gift from God. Isn't he the one who Back to the beginning of the book. <laughs> See, back to the, the one who breathed into man the breath of life, and he became a living soul. The very fact that we breathe is not to be taken lightly. It's a manna gift. It's just in the moment. Think about it. Um, maybe there's moments when you're not remembering just quite right, but he not only has given us breath, he's given us brains. Now, my brain is deteriorating. I don't know about some of you, but my brain is deteriorating. It's not the brain it used to be, but it's still the brain that's part of the image of God in me. His breath, his brain, his intelligence, capacity for intelligence, his brawn. God can do anything. That God dwells in me. He has given me capacities to, to do and to achieve. He's given me strength to do a lot and to focus on, yes, I can think God thoughts. I can choose that. Yes, I can do with the strength I have God things. And, and I'm not alone. The fourth B, I told Bethany I had Bs today. The fourth one is the brotherhood slash sisterhood. We're not alone. We've got a whole group of people. Around. It's one of the things about being a part of a church family. You've got people that will bear that with you. They'll walk with you. They're not going to criticize you. They're going to hold you up, bear one another's burdens. Then there's not just that, the here and now, the, 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 uh, the man of moment, but there's manna for the millennia. It's, I just had to pick that. I know a millennia is not long enough, but it's, it, it works well, you know, for alliteration. Manna for the, the millennia, for the forever. Jesus, Son of Man, Son of God in flesh, Lord and Savior, celebrating with Him, eating from the bread of life, inviting you and me to drink from the water of life and to eat freely of the tree of life forever. From the beginning of the book, can you see it where Satan says, oh, there's going to be an alternative story. This is the one you want to follow. To 
the end of God's story, the record of humans on the faces of this earth and beyond into eternity is consistent with God. God in spirit and flesh, bread of life, loves to feed and sustain not only the life here and the now, but all into eternity. So when you gather to pray this Thursday, right? That's this Thursday for Thanksgiving. Whew. I saw some people nod, and I'm pretty sure they weren't falling asleep yet. We're going to wrap up. We're wrapping up right now. When you gather to pray this Thanksgiving, take the opportunity to truly acknowledge and to celebrate which side of your daily bread it's buttered on? Not only your moment, but also in the millennial. And then invite someone to join you in the feast. Let's pray. Father, you have told us that every perfect gift comes from above. The Father of lights, the giver of all good gifts. And today, thank you, Lord, that we can focus in, that you can, you can remind us as we go home, honey, let's talk about the manna moments. What, what are the moments that God is feeding us right here and now, providing for our needs? And, and sweetheart, or friend, or son, or daughter, or neighbor, thank you, God, for the perfect gift of manna into the millennia. And, and God, would you please, as we leave this place, would you remind our frail minds to pass out the invitations and share the manna that you've given to us. In Jesus' name.